And we are live. It's Dr. J here in the house with Evan Brand. Evan, how are we doing today, man? Hey, man. Happy Monday. I'm doing really well. Happy Monday to you as well. I know we chatted kind of in our pregame interview. We chatted about what we're going to talk about. And we kind of chatted about histamine. Histamine went really good last week. We, have, we see a lot of patients with potential histamine sensitivity. And the histamine a lot of times may not be... Oh, little reverb there. Histamine may not be a root cause of the issue. It may just be a symptom of other issues going on in the gut. And we always kind of keep that in mind. A lot of people, you know, if you don't have a lot of experience clinically, it's easy to think that histamine is the root cause. And then you feel like you have all these food restrictions and you're not sure what next steps to do. And that's tough. So we're going to be focusing on SIBO. We can even expand that to gut infections and histamine issues. So I'm really excited for today's topic. Yeah, you made a great point right from the gate, which is people that are focusing on the nutrition piece too much or focusing on maybe some of the supplemental things. Correct. Like many people discuss um, DAO, which is something I'm experimenting with just to play with it and see how it works. Uh, DAO is the enzyme in your body that naturally helps degrade histamine. But as you have infections and stress and toxins, you are either unable to produce less. I mean, we're not 100% confident with the mechanism. You may produce less or it may mm -hmm. be just less effective. So people will do a DAO supplement and say, oh, well, I feel better. I'm not having these food reactions, and they'll just stop there. But this is where we're starting now at the end of that rope, and then we're taking you to the whole next level. Because if you stop there, you're just – you haven't addressed what's actually going on. Exactly. So in general, histamine is a neurotransmitter made from histidine. It's designed to help with the inflammatory response. It's designed to vasodilate, open up the blood flat uh, the blood vessels. So you have better blood flow, which helps with an inflammatory response. So you bump your elbow, right? You bump your head. There's a histamine response that helps vasodilate, helps migrate a lot of those white blood cells into that area, kind of helps promote healing. The problem is acute acutely in an acute situation, not that big of a deal because it happens and then your body recovers. We're more talking about a chronic kind of low grade inflammation or low grade histamine issue where you're chronically swollen, you're chronically inflamed. You may have a lot of chronic histamine symptoms. This could be headaches. It could be flushing, right? That chronic red and flushing symptoms. It could be nausea. It could be hives, right? Those kind of wheels or uticaria hives in the skin could be fatigue, it could be brain fog, it could be just kind of chronic low-grade swelling, it could be allergic shiners under the eyes with a lot of um, lymphatic pooling in the face. So it's good to keep an eye on these symptoms as they could be part of what's going on. And then, of course, there's a lot of medication that are typically treating these things, whether it's Zyrtec or Allegra, Allegra or Pepsid-AC, different medications. The problem with a lot of the medications, they tend to have more side effects, whether it's fatigue or brain fog, and a lot of people, they just get knocked out when they take a lot of these medications. So they're kind of stuck because their performance and ability to function at work, if they're doing hard work or dealing with their kids, they're going to be pretty much a zombie or zonked out for a lot of them. So we want to really get to the root cause of why these symptoms are present. And a lot of times the gut's going to be a big role because a lot of chronic inflammation is going to be at the gut level, whether it's inflammation from food that you're dealing with, whether it's gluten or dairy and or other histamine foods, right? Fermented foods or aged meats or citrus or avocados, or it could be from a deeper infection that sets you up to be more sensitive, right? If we have SIBO or bacterial overgrowth or other infections, it's gonna potentially make it harder for you to digest food. The harder it is for you to digest food, the greater chance that you're gonna develop food allergens. And also the more inflammation in your gut, the greater chance that you're going to have gut permeability. So the more permeable your gut is, the more these foods have a way of getting into the bloodstream, the more your immune system sees them in an undigested state, increases the chance that we're going to make antibodies for those foods. And then also just the fact that we have other bacteria that may be slipping into the bloodstream. Uh, these compounds are lipopolysaccharides. These can also go and create histamine issues. They can also go to the up to the brain, hit and hit a lot of brain fog and mood issues. So there's a lot of like dominoes that get hit. Histamine may be one of those dominoes, but there's a lot of dominoes that get may hit. And then you have a lot of symptoms happening from it. And then the question is you have to kind of corral all these symptoms in to a root cause of like, what's the next step? Because it gets very, really overwhelming. Yeah, I want to go back to the symptoms real quick. Something that's really interesting is the fact that you could have issues with your sleep, you know, trouble falling asleep, or even 
uh, dizziness. You know, I noticed when I went low histamine with my diet, some of this kind of disequilibrium dizziness stuff that I was having that I thought was mold exposure or possibly co-infections like Bartonella. I noticed when I went lower histamine, it got better. Like my head got more clear and then I was able to go to sleep better. So this is kind of why you mentioned some people do the antihistamines and then they get knocked out. You know, I think part of the reason that some people's nervous mm -hmm. systems are so revved up is excess histamine, but here they are taking melatonin. Now, that may help or passion flower, or, you know, we like to use like uh, motherwort or valerian or theanine Correct. or skullcap. There's a ton of good sleep options, but you may be missing the boat. So those herbs are fine. Those are much safer than a sleep drug, which are extremely hard to get people off of. But the, the, the sleep herbs may not be the root cause. It may be histamine. So you could try going with a lower histamine diet during the meantime. That's something we may recommend you do is go lower histamine while we're working on labs or waiting on labs. And then if we find that just by lowering histamine in the diet, all of a sudden you have less blood pressure problems, you fall asleep easier, you're not flushing, you're not having the nasal congestion, you've got rid of headaches, maybe your energy's better. Well, then that's a great clue that we're onto something, but we don't want to get you stuck on low histamine forever. I just don't think that's a way to live. So that's when we're going to go into these gut infections. So you mentioned bacterial overgrowth and how we're going to be looking at that is with stool and urine. So uh, Justin and I run, I don't know, pro between us both, probably thousands of labs per year. And I would say, now granted, we're a little bit biased, right? Because people that come to us have already been to many practitioners. And so they often are going to have real problems. But I would say... 90% of people we look at are going to have some sort of a bacterial overgrowth problem that's leading to these issues. 100%. So histamine is an important first step to look at and kind of know the histamine foods. We've already talked about some of the foods last time. So then we, I think there's a handout up there from last time as well from last week. So take a look at last week's podcast, try to put some of those links down below so you can access them. But more common histamine foods are going to be ones that are rich in probiotics, fermented foods. And that's tough because people are following a paleo template or following Western Day Price or understand the benefits of probiotics and fermented foods. That's kind of a curveball. And a lot of people kind of walk into this and they're like, wait a minute, that's supposed to be good for you. Yeah, it should be good for you. But for some people, it may be a problem with histamine. And if they have SIBO, it could be a problem as well. I call it probiotic intolerance. And it's very possible that's what's happening. Uh, next are going to be your citrus foods, your aged meats. Of course, a lot of paleo foods are going to be on that list. So if you're just going paleo, you cut about half of them out anyway, just by default. You know what got then, me in trouble, though? Coconut aminos. I love oh, coconut, yeah. aminos. coconut aminos. Coconut aminos are pretty high. Super high. And I was, fer I, I was uh, you know, there's basically fermented coconut blossom nectar is what it is. But, of course, the longer things ferment, the higher the histamine. So I was marinating yes. my steaks. I'd marinate a steak. And then maybe even add a little extra coconut aminos during the cooking process. Yes. And I was going too crazy with it. So I'm taking a break from coconut aminos. That's something that gets heavily used and abused uh, in healthy foods because people are trying to ditch soy sauce, for example. Exactly. And that's a good first step. And if you don't, if you don't have a histamine issue, that's a really good first step. But if you do and you have some symptoms, like we mentioned earlier, then you know what where to look. But in general, regarding histamine... Um, we want to keep those foods down. So I mentioned some of the avocados, the tomatoes, the eggplants. So if you're cutting out nightshades, you may get that out by default. Avocados are kind of a curveball, right? Because that's a really good fat. We also have the aged meats. So try not to let meats sit around longer than a day or two, or even meats that tend to be preserved, whether it's jerky or, or bacon or those kind of things. And then of course, we have um, your probiotic foods and then our citrus. So those can be curveballs. And then obviously teas and coffee. I'm pretty sure teas are the big one. Teas and energy drinks, that's a DAO uh, inhibitor. So they're not really high in histamine, but they inhibit that enzyme, DAO, that helps break down histamine. So yeah. we'll keep that in the back of our mind. So in general, uh, the more inflammation... We, go ahead, yeah. Uh, I was just going to say one thing about drinks. I've had some people that go on to like a Zevia, like these natural stevia sodas, where you're doing carbonated water. And a lot of time there's uh, added... Um, citric acid to those. And so there's a lot of citric acid added to some of those drinks. And I've had people drink those and then all of a sudden they flush out. And so just cutting the drink out with the citric acid, that could be something that kind of created some type of either a mast cell response or a histamine response. So that's just one other, one other potential cause. And 
it's tough because if you're eating, like if you're drinking a carbonated drink and you're doing a steak with coconut aminos, and then you've got your sauerkraut or your kimchi on your plate with your uh, whole grass fed dairy, it's tough to know what you're actually responding to. So sometimes you really have to just keep a food journal and go really simple where you just drink that carbonated drink for 15 minutes and then wait and see if you get a response and then move on to the next food item and the next food item. Hopefully the average person, it's not that tricky, but for some, it can be. 100%. And of course, we already mentioned the kombucha. There's some higher sugar ones. There's some lower sugar ones. If you're probiotic intolerant, that'd probably be something you want to pull out for at least a couple of weeks to a month and see kind of where you sit after after the fact. You just got to make sure that we're fixing digestion. We have enough HCL and hydrochloric acid and enzymes and good digestive support. Foods not being digested appropriately are going to create stress and inflammation in the gut. And then we got to look deeper at, you know, making sure the common food allergens are out because a lot of times regular food allergens like you get from grains or dairy or lentils or legumes, those can create similar symptoms of histamine. And the question is, well, is there a histamine response to these foods from an inflammatory perspective? It's possible, right? Because the more you create inflammation, we know that histamine is a part of the inflammatory response. It's it, it's part responsible for the vasodilation that happens. So it's possible that inflammation from other foods that aren't necessarily histamine sensitive foods could potentially drive histamine symptoms. We have to keep that in the back of our mind. And this is why it's so hard because you're like, wait a minute, this food's not a high histamine food yet I'm having high histamine symptoms, how do I connect the dots? And that's how, it's all from inflammation. Inflammation is the first domino and there's many different domino paths or trails that could take based on inflammation being present. Now, the hidden sources of inflammation are things that we don't really see or we're not aware of, like low stomach acid, low enzymes. We're not necessarily aware of that. We may be aware of the fact, hey, I take hydrochloric acid, I feel better, I have less bloating, I have less gas, I'm more regular, or I do a SIBO test, I treat my SIBO and my motility, thus my histamine symptoms improve after the fact. That's also another thing that can create awareness, but you may not be aware of it unless someone helps guide you in the process and does some testing as well. Yeah, and I'm not gonna say that all the time it happens to older people, we're talking 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, but in general, I think it's gonna be more common for someone who is older because they're gonna make less stomach acid just due to age. Now we have seen, uh, kids and teenagers that have a lot of skin issues and gut issues. And I was one of those teenagers. And that's because my diet was terrible, right? So you'll still get younger, younger people that have these histamine intolerance issues, mainly because their gut's been wrecked by antibiotics, or they just had a bad diet to begin with. But if we're just saying, as you mentioned, some of these uh, dominoes that fall, one of the dominoes that falls with age is just HCL. So you become at a higher risk of getting bacterial overgrowth, because now you don't have enough acid to neutralize what you get exposed to from your foods. 100%. And again, I think part of it is as you get older, there's a natural drop in hydrochloric acid and thus enzymes as you get older. So there's that. So I think age does play a role because of stomach acid dropping. And we need stomach acid to activate our enzymes and we need stomach acid to activate our bile salts. And we know bile has a natural antibacterial effects. So the less bile you have, the more easy it is for bad bacteria to grow. So if we have good stomach acid, that's going to provide an antimicrobial environment, meaning harder for bad critters to grow. And then with good HCL, we also produce better bile salts. Bile salts have that good acid byproduct that keeps bacteria down as well. That's why you see a lot of people that have SIBO, they're also typically taking bile salts to help with one, the environment, but also two, being able to break down fats. Really, really important. So how about people without a gallbladder? It sounds like they would be oh, more at risk for this problem then. Well, they have to be on bile support for life now mm -hmm. because what's happened is they don't really have a gallbladder anymore. Their common hepatic bile duct in the liver is now the gallbladder. And so it doesn't hold bile. Like the gallbladder concentrates bile like 15 to 20 X. And then it, it contracts and punctuates the release of bile at the right time, i.e. you have a fatty meal, you have a hormone that's produced or a neurotransmitter kind of peptide called cholecystokinin that triggers the gallbladder to contract. It releases all this stored bile that's been concentrated and that bile can now come in and hit that fat and digest it and emulsify it. The problem is you don't have that punctuated release because the gallbladder is gone. So it just kind of drips. It just drips, drips, drips like a leaky faucet all day long. 
and then you don't have the concentration of it. So it's kind of a little bit more watered down. It's a little bit weaker and you don't have the concentrated release at time of that fat being ingested. So that's the problem. Yeah, well, in so, the conventional doctors don't educate people on this when they go into a potential gallbladder removal surgery, they'll just say, yeah, your liver still is going to make some bile for you, but they don't talk about that concentration factor and how it's literally, you know, that's like taking a, you know, a little fairy dust of some HCL and throwing it in and hoping it works. It's not a therapeutic amount that's going to come without that gallbladder. I mean, people no. are still going to survive, right? I mean, there's tons of people living, but it's just they're not thriving. Well, what tends to happen after that is to cover up a lot of those symptoms, conventional medicine says, well, you have to be careful of your fat consumption. Well, yeah, you do because you don't have the same level of bile output, but you need good fat. You need fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. Your long chain omega-3 fatty acids are really important for your health. So yeah, not getting good fats, that's a bad thing. I mean, we've seen with the obesity epidemic over the last hundred years, the last 30 or so years, fat consumption has dropped significantly and weight's gone up. So it's not really a fat issue based on the correlation. It's really a carbohydrate issue, maybe a trans fat issue, maybe an excess refined junky vegetable oil issue, but good healthy fats are not part of the play. And if we now affect our digestion when we can't absorb those things, well, every membrane in our body has good fats in it. So we need healthy fats to make our cell membranes. We need vitamin A, which is a fat soluble vitamin for our thyroid receptor sites. We need um, fish oil for inflammation. That's our long chain omega-3s. We need uh, cholesterol, which tends to come trapped in with animal fat for our hormones, for our brain mass. So all this stuff is so important for healthy hormones, healthy body, healthy brain. Yep, absolutely. And uh, there's no education on that. It's just, yep, you got a gallbladder, it's got to come out, and then that's it. And then they don't have to, here's the interesting thing, the surgeon and, and the doctors and such, they don't deal with the collateral damage. They just kind of no. cut it out and move on. So then they end up coming to us, hey, look, here's this list of 20 symptoms I developed after gallbladder removal surgery. Not to get too distracted from our from our topic, but this is all related because it could have been all a, connected. Histamine, a histamine problem could have been uh, what led up to this, and then it could have you know continued after the removal. And I've done some articles and podcasts on gallbladder issues in the past. And there are some common paleo foods that could be a gallbladder issue as well. Pork's one of them, especially bacon. There's also a histamine overlap there. Um, so is, I think, sauerkraut as well, onions. So there's a bunch of paleo foods that like, you know, on the surface, you're like, wait a minute, these are pretty healthy foods. But if you have a gallbladder issue, it could be a driving factor. And yes, some of these foods overlap with histamines. So take a look at, just go to my site, justinhealth.com, just type in gallbladder and you'll find those articles and videos there for y'all. Perfect. So we, we hit on the, the SIBO. Uh, we often discuss that CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth is very commonly occurring at the same time. And so that's where once we get the proper lab testing, looking at stool and urine, primarily, we're going to be finding the answers that we need to start resolving this. So as we mentioned, you may be using extra enzymes and acids. Maybe you're using um, histamine degrading enzymes supplementally to try the to DAO. help. Yeah, you're using that as a Band-Aid, knowing that you're working backwards. And then once we come in with herbs to address, which is the, the opposite of the conventional uh, neomycin, uh, diflucan, nystatin kind of protocol, we're going to come in with herbs instead, and then eventually retest, and then of course, watch symptom improvement at the same time. But with retesting labs, with watching symptom improvement, maybe doing those Band-Aids, you can reverse this issue. Yeah, we need to calm down the inflammation in the gut, because those mast cells are what's making a lot of histamine, right? So your basophils are in your blood. When those basophils go into the tissue, goes into the gut lining, they're, they're all become mast cells. And mast cells are what produces histamine. And imagine this, you know, this mast cell sitting here, the longer we're not exposing ourselves to inflammatory food, that mast cells like swelling up because it's used to having a reserve. Now that reserves is kind of like kind of engorging itself bigger and bigger. And then now you eat some food that's kind of off your food recommendation and phew, you get this massive flood of histamine and where you feel like even worse. And this is what happens when someone's on a good diet for a while and then they go off the wagon. They're like, holy smokes, I got hit by a bus. What happened? I thought I was doing really good. Why have I not become more adaptable at these foods? Well, it takes some time. And then a lot of times these mass cells are just sitting there in the short run, filling up with histamine, waiting for you to just go off your diet. 
Yeah. What about alcohol? Do you have anything to say about that? Because I had a woman who'd been off alcohol for a long time. We kind of discussed, hey, you probably shouldn't do it. Your gut barriers toast. And she went to some work party and had two drinks. And then she emailed me the next day. Oh my God, I'm so miserable. Alcohol has never done this to me before. Granted, she was on a protocol. So some of the herbs mixing with alcohol is not smart, but just from a avoidance perspective, leaky gut perspective and then going back to it she seemed like she got worse than alcohol used to make her feel do you have any insight on that yeah so i always tell patients like don't add any alcohol in until we have a a level of clarity a level of improvement so then if we add in alcohol and we go backwards we know that the alcohol brought us backwards that way we're not feeling crappy and then we're putting alcohol in there maybe the alcohol is what's holding us back from getting better and we don't know it right because we always felt crappy to begin with yeah. So kind of get clean first. So then when you get dirty again, you know, okay, I know what clean feels like. There's something that changed here. So regarding alcohol, there's different quality of alcohol. So you could have like a mixed drink with a whole bunch of sugar in it. You know, that's going to cause a whole bunch of problems just because of the sugar and the crap that's in there. And obviously there's like different wines that may have pesticides or sulfates or potential gluten in there. A lot of wines are contaminated because there's a lot of flour that lines the barrel of the wines. So hard alcohol is going to be your cleanest and keeping the sugar content if you do a mixed drink. And then also like a champagne or a dry white wine will kind of be your next step up, right? The drier whites or the drier kind of champagne is going to have less sugar. It's going to have less potential irritants. So you kind of start with the food, the kinds of alcohol that will have the less additives and inflammation compounds and then kind of work your way back. And that way, it just gives you the chance of having the least issues. Now, there are some cultures where they just have less DAO to hang out with in, your, in, their, in their guts and their bloodstream. So they're going to react to alcohol. They'll get like a facial flush. You see this in a lot of Asian cultures because they don't quite make as much DAO. So they'll take that Pepsid AC a lot of times, and that blocks that histamine response. So a lot of cultures may just have less histamine issues. You see it with uh, Asians and alcohol. They get very flushed. So you just got to know where you're at. And then just try to choose an alcohol that's going to have the least possible chance of a reaction. And then you can always do some activated charcoal in between to kind of help with that too. Yep. That's good advice. Uh, anything else you think we should say about testing or herbs or things we're doing to, to work on this issue? Well, there's different herbs that we're going to recommend depending on if we're methane dominant SIBO or hydrogen dominant SIBO. And a lot of times people have the right to have more than one issue going on at once. So you could have SIBO and a parasite infection. You could have SIBO and H. pylori. You could have SIBO and CIFO. And CIFO is nothing more than a fungal overgrowth. It could be candida, various different yeasts, mainly the big ones, candida. But you could have all of these things going on together. It may not just be SIBO. You have yeah. the right to have more than one issue. People get fixated. They're like, I know it's candida. I know it's a worm. I know it's this. And it may be, but it may be that and a whole bunch of other things. So keep your mind open to all the different stressors that could be going on at the same time. Well, the funny thing is too, maybe the person's right and they did have a parasite or they did have candida, but we may find something even higher up on the priority list than that. Like if I see, you know, okra toxin levels, we know okra toxin and other mold toxins, we know those damage the gut. Bingo. If I see those things off the chart and I look at dizziness and they can't sleep and they got heart palpitations and all these other symptoms that don't sound like SIBO we might go after that first and SIBO and histamine and all that may be secondary and tertiary problems. So that's another fun and important reason that we do multiple tests on people is because if you come in and you're like, Hey, Dr. J, I know it's SIBO, just run the SIBO test. He's going to say, no, I really think we need to also look at this and this and that. And that's not just because we like to run labs. That's because we like to have data so that when our puzzle pieces are on the table, we can make a more complete picture as opposed to trying to identify your problem and make a protocol based on one little piece. If we don't, I mean, if we're using the, just the one little puzzle piece, it's just not, you know, your success rate may be hindered. 110%. And I think it's, it's really important to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. There could be a lot of different things happening. And like you mentioned earlier, an important component is the history. Hey, do you live in a house where there was uh, recent water damage? Hey, when you're in your home and you leave for a period of time, do you feel better? Have you rectified the water damage? How did you do it? Is there any visible mold in your home? So these are really important questions to know. And sometimes I'll see in my history, I'll see patients, yeah, there's water damage and they didn't really do much to address it. And they really feel foggy in the home. They feel better when they're outside getting fresh air. 
these are important signs and symptoms. A lot of times you'll see more neurological things like you mentioned, Evan, whether it's brain fog or just spaciness or headaches. Uh, and again, we're looking for that timing in regards to a flood, or there could be even a chronic issue where there's just high humidity in the home. And that's where doing some of the mold testing for the home is ideal. The mold testing for the home is great because if you have, you know, five people in the house and we get a positive mold test, well, we know that that could be affecting all five people. So it's good to know that. Yeah, absolutely. I had a building I went into when I was in Florida and I literally got flushed after entering the building. I had like a reaction to the building. I started to feel off. I was just like, whoa, this is not a good building. And I look up at the ceiling and there's water spots, water stains all over the ceiling. I was like, oh my God. And this is not, oh, Evan, you're crazy. This is placebo. You looked at the ceiling and then you convinced yourself you felt bad. No, I felt bad before I even saw the ceiling. This was on the way walking out of the building. I look up and see all the water stains. So uh, most people are not that sensitive and most no. people are, are not that in tune to their situation to know, hey, uh, I've been in this building for an hour. And every time I am in this particular building, uh, for example, like college students, they'll say, when I go to this one classroom, I can't focus. I get brain fog. I get really tired. Maybe the subject is boring and they don't like the teacher, but it could be the building is particularly making them bad. So I've had some college students I work with where I'll just tell them, hey, try to sit in a different part of that room. Or if it's a big auditorium, move to a different corner where maybe you're closer to a door where you get fresh air and see if you feel better. And yeah, and obviously this is a more like nuanced small percentage of the population but it does happen and I, I want people to know they're not crazy this is a real phenomenon you may be experiencing yeah and the nice thing about it is you should be able to figure out some correlation from this because you're in that building you're out you're in your home you're out maybe you're walking around all day so hopefully you can notice a correlation there like you mentioned earlier everyone's not going to be that level of sensitive right there's different genetic variation obviously depending on how long you've been exposed to something and how much is it already in your cells in your fat in your body already can make you more sensitive. So with some of your mycotoxin testing, which we'll do a lot of urinary testing for mold, we'll see some of these things. And we, if we do a urinary test for mold, we have to also challenge it. So we're gonna be using glutathione for at least a couple of days ahead of time, just because if your detoxification pathways are a little bit weak, or let's say the molds overwhelm your system, you may have lower glutathione anyway, so it may be harder to push the mold out to begin with. So you have to keep that in the back of your head that's why we test the home first, because if we have a high level of mold in the home, we don't see a lot coming out in the urine. Well, it's really important that we provoke that and just give you enough detoxification and support to at least get a window on how much is coming out in your urine. That way we have a baseline. So as we treat over three, six, nine months, we can come back and see if those levels are dropping. Yeah. Infrared sauna is great too for that. You can measure a lot of higher uh, increased levels after sauna. So if somebody can't tolerate glutathione for some reason, you could do a sauna. Uh, and also fasting, which is pretty interesting. This is why a lot of the samples we do in the first thing in the morning, because fasting can help excrete some of these toxins too. So uh, we could obviously dive more into that on another show. My mold levels are almost gone. I had okra toxin level of 195. You want it below four. I started but with fasting out. though, with fasting, yeah. you only can do that really acutely though. That's like a short-term thing. It's not a long-term strategy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just talking overnight fasting, but maybe, in, you know, like intermittent fasting, maybe in between those meals, you are excreting a little more and flushing a little more toxin out. Got it. Okay. So you were saying okra toxin, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. I think the uh, reference range was below four is optimal. And I started out at a 195 and here we are talking almost exactly one year later and my levels are down to a 15. So it's 195 to 15. So that's like a 98%, 95% reduction. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot, but it took a year. And that's hardcore work. That's uh, conventional and prescription binders. That's sauna. That's extreme avoidance. That's liver, lymphatics. I mean, that's a lot of work. So I just want to end this by uh, putting a realistic time frame in people's heads. You know, when they have a, reaction and they take a Benadryl and they feel better in half an hour, you know, they're really happy about that. Or when they have a headache and they take an Advil uh, and they feel better in 30 minutes, that's great. But with these issues here, we're talking reversing potentially 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of toxins and damaged gut barriers and overgrowth and antibiotic usage and all that crap. So, you know, when we tell somebody, hey, six months to a year timeline, I think that's extremely short when you factor all that in. 110% man.
I like it. I think you're on the right track with that. I think we're on the right track with today's chat. We're trying to connect the SIBO component, trying to also connect the different gut components that connect to SIBO. And then also, I think the mold, I think we need to do our own little show on mold and histamine. Maybe next week we'll come back and do mold and histamine. I think that's really important. I think it's a, a big issue. And the problem is a lot of people have multiple issues at the same time. And this is where it's really hard. We want to glom onto one thing. We want this one, hey, we want to have this one label. Hey, this is my issue. It's kind of easy to wrap your head around that, but it could be a lot of different issues. So everyone that's listening, keep your mind open to there being lots of problems at the same time. And also if you're overwhelmed, this is where it's good to reach out to a practitioner like Evan, evanbrand.com or myself, Dr. J at justinhealth.com. If you want to dive in deeper, kind of get your arms wrapped around it with some objective lab testing. So we actually know what is happening underneath the hood, so to speak. Yep. Evan, anything else you want to add today, man? No, I just want to give people a little bit of boost of uh, hope and encouragement and just say, hey, look, as you mentioned, there may be layers to this, but you can peel back the layers. You can, you can get better. No matter how long you've suffered, you can, you can, you can. Keep that in mind. Yeah, and your story is great with the mold because you really had some pretty debilitating symptoms and mold's one of those things. It's like, if you don't know it's there, man, it's like, you're just in, a, in an environment where there's just toxins all around you and you don't even see it and it's a slow creep and the time symptoms start rearing their head, it's been going on for years. That's the problem. Yeah, I gotta give a shout out to our mutual friend, Dr. Jack Wolfson for telling me that it was mold. I didn't wanna believe it, but I was talking to him and said, hey, I was waking up dizzy. This is weird, blood pressure's going all over the place. And he writes back in all caps, one word, mold. And that started it all. Yeah, and the thing is, I mean, I'll give credit to Jack. I think that's he's right on there. The problem is there are a lot of, let's just say, mold myopic doctors where everything's mold, right? True. Everything's mold. And that's a problem too, because it may not be. So the difference is with you, you got this feedback from Dr. Jack. You tested your home. Guess what? Really high in mold. You tested your urine. You provoked it really high in mold. So we had some objective data to kind of support us. So we weren't kind of flying blind. So I think you did the right thing. And for people that are listening to this and think it's mold, get that testing done first so you can be more confident. And then more importantly, because you've gone through the whole remediation process, that's even more overwhelming. And that's where you want to work with an expert because you can feel like you have to spend six figures to get your home remediated. And that's not the case. You can do it for way, way cheaper. And it can be, um, let's just say, a process that isn't as bad as it thinks or you, you, you feel like it is based on what you see online and everything. Yeah. And, uh, and to Jack's uh, defense, you know, he is he works on hearts, you know, he's not a mold doctor, but his wife was really sick. Yes, the past few years from mold. So luckily, he had had firsthand experience. So he thought, hey, this sounds kind of weird. And at least had enough uh, in the trenches experience with his own wife to know, hey, that might be it. So very interesting how it all turns out. I think it's one of the biggest hidden epidemics going on. Yep. I see the whole mold thing and the Lyme thing as well. Anytime there's some kind of a weird neurological symptom, people throw that out there and it could be right, but get the whole thing worked up. I mean, the thing with Evan, Evan had three different other infections to begin with. So you had, I think, Giardia, Blasto, and H. pylori. Uh, crypto. Yep. Crypt and crypto, Giardia, Giardia H. pylori, right? Uh -huh, so yep. Now, just kind of for everyone listening so they can have insight, Evan had already addressed those issues ahead of time and he had gotten a little bit better, but there was still something holding him back. So if Evan just myopically focused on the mold and didn't get rid of those infections, he may not have had the same level of improvement. So there's kind of an order of operations and how we want to hit this. And because you had three serious, I mean, each one of those infections individually is kind of a big deal. The fact that you had all three going on at the same time, I call it the three amigos, it's definitely going to be a major stressor on your body. And then you throw in the mold and the adrenal stress and then potentially blood sugar issues. Yeah. So you had a whole host of things that we were able to kind of sequence up and have it all make sense. Yeah. And we're talking, we're talking over a four to five year period. You know, those gut infections yeah. were cleared out almost five years before the mold protocol. And that's not due to, uh, that. that's not the way that necessarily I wanted it or that that we, we wanted it to happen. It's just the way it happened. That was just yep. the exposures came later. And so uh, not everything could be perfectly sequenced in care, but it's just a matter of peeling back the layers you can to get some level of improvement. And that quality of life hopefully will continue to motivate you and allow you to pursue other layers of healing. Well, the nice thing with us is we're getting better because we're also treating ourselves and thousands of patients. So because of that, it's not just like, you know, textbook information, it's, it's real world actual results kind of driving 
treatment, driving protocols, driving kind of our perspective on what the next steps are for patients. So it allows your treatment, allowed me to get better at this and allow you to get other patients better. So we just continue to grow like that, which is excellent. Yeah, it's a very, very, very cool place to operate. Anything else you want to add, Evan? That's it. I'll mention the links again. You can reach out to Justin, Dr. J at justinhealth.com. My website's evanbrand.com. We both offer uh, intro consults where you can book 15, 20 minutes. You can chat about your symptoms and goals. See if you're a good fit for care. If so, uh, we'd love to help you. We're very grateful to be in this position. So uh, we honor it and we'll be back next week. Excellent. You guys have a phenomenal day. Look forward to checking in soon. Take care, y'all. Bye now. See ya.